me a favor and just check in with that if you would, and uh, and help us. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, uh, there's information back there by the sign-up sheet that kind of explains what we're doing, uh, trying to get to know each other even better as we uh, move into our next seven years together. What's that? Oh, that's true. There you go. Well, we also uh, want to mention that this Wednesday is going to be uh, uh, our wonderful Wednesday. So at 6 o'clock, join us for dinner here at the church. Uh, we also have our grief support group, which is, uh, which is uh, resuming this Wednesday as well, 5 o'clock. So if, you have, if you're grieving the loss of a, uh, a loved one, uh, if you're grieving the loss of a job, if you're just grieving and you're not sure what, what's going on, uh, come and join us for the grief support group. It's a wonderful time in fellowship and ministry together. Uh, and uh, we start at 5 in the library. We'd love to have any of you join us for that and stick around for Wonderful Wednesday following that at 6. Uh, so we want to invite you to that as well this Wednesday. Now, we are always growing as disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen? We want to constantly be growing, and, and the way we do that is we get together with each other and we seek the Lord together. There's no better way than to come together with other believers and to... Uh, to uh, dig into God's Word and to talk about uh, what that means for our lives. And so we want to challenge you, if you haven't found your way into one of our, uh, one of our classes or small groups, one of our Bible studies or prayer times, uh, we want to invite you to do that. So please uh, check out your bulletin. There's all sorts of things going on in there. But we have a couple of opportunities for you uh, this morning, in fact. Uh, there's no time like the present. Uh, so if you have some time after fellowship time, you can join the Seekers group. They're continuing their look at, uh, at uh, prayer warriors. And uh, you can join my group as we wrap up a series on uh, the, the uh, membership vows, the prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. Today we wrap that up with witness, which dovetails beautifully with where we'll be going as we uh, come into uh, a new series that we're going to be doing by Pastor Greg Laurie uh, called uh, Tell Someone. Uh, there's a little video teaching and some questions and discussion that we're going to have. Uh, and that's going to be in my group starting next week. We'll pick that up, but we'll uh, preview it this week as we talk about what it means to witness uh, as a member of Jesus Christ's uh, church here in the United Methodist Church. So uh, check out one of those. If those times don't work for you, plug into one of our other groups. Come and find me if you need help finding that, that right group for you. Um, uh, one other opportunity you have starting up again this week, uh, we'll be taking our third session on the book of Acts for the Tuesday morning Bible study. So if you're a part of the Tuesday morning study, and you'd like to uh, come for that uh, Tuesday at 9 o'clock in the library. And uh, if you haven't been a part of that group in the past, there's no better time uh, than now to jump right in. We're right at the very beginning of the book of Acts, and it would be a great time to plug in. So uh, join us for Acts on Tuesday at 9 o'clock. We also uh, have uh, a very uh, wonderful special announcement uh, as we'll be, we'll be celebrating Matt's ministry with the youth and, and uh, others who've been touched by his work here. Uh, during the children's time, as we say goodbye to him, we also uh, say hello to a new uh, staff person who's being trained today. Uh, so if you would all just look up into the balcony. There you go. We don't normally do this, but, uh, but you see Greg, our normal AV guy. He's been our AV guy for a long time. We're grateful the, for all that he's done. And uh, we welcome uh, Elliot Albright uh, to our uh, team as he takes over for Greg uh, moving forward. And so we're uh, Find uh, Elliot after the service and welcome him and, and, uh, and, uh, and to our community of faith. So we're grateful to have you, and we're looking forward to putting his uh, knowledge to, to good use. So please uh, find him after service and, and welcome him. With that, let us greet each other in the peace and love of Christ as we begin our worship service this morning.
is in you, Lord, my strength, is in you, Lord, my hope, is in you, Lord, in you, it's in you. I will praise you with all of my life. I will praise you with all of my strength, with all of my life, with all of my strength, all of my hope is in you. My life is in you, Lord, my strength is in you, Lord, my hope is in you, Lord, in you, it's in you. My life is in you, Lord, my strength is in you, Lord, my hope is in you, Lord, in you, it's in you. Please be seated. And as we enter into this sacred time of worship, I invite you to join with me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we come before you hungry to receive your promises, hungry to realize our potential in your loving embrace. Lord, we come that we might be inspired, that our faith might be nurtured and grown, that our life would continuously be yielded to you, surrendered to you, that we might worship you this day and that that worship would bring glory and honor to you. Lord, we ask that as we gather in worship, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us, that it would come into our hearts and warm them, that it would come into our minds and inspire them, that you would take hold of our lives right now, in this moment, transform us to your glory, set us on fire with your Holy Spirit, and send us into the world that we might shine brightly as beacons of light in this dark world. Lord, be with us as we worship you in the powerful and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. I want to invite the kids down front for just a moment. All the children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Well, how are you guys doing today? Good. Are you sure? Have you all recovered from vacation Bible school yet? You have? That's the joy of being young. Well, what do you suppose we have in the box today? Any ideas? What do you think? Oxygen. Oxygen? You guys are so clever. What do you think, Libby? 
Air, yeah. Mm -hmm. Something, probably. Any other guesses? Now, Jason's been waiting for two weeks because he was supposed to bring last week and we did VBS instead. So, shall we find out? All right, let's see what Jason brought today. Oh boy, what do we have here? We have Lego guys. <laughs> Looks like we have a Lego cop, and what is that guy? He's a military person. He's a military person? Yeah. All right, so we have a we have a Lego cop and a Lego soldier. Look at that. Well, how are we going to see God in our friends, the Lego guys, today? What do you think? God made us, and God loves us, and God loves them too. I like that. That's very good. How else are we going to see God in our Lego friends today? What do you think? Any ideas? No? No ideas? None whatsoever. It's a tough crowd this morning. Do I have an idea? Well, you know, I kind of do have an idea. It's kind of funny you ask that. You know, it's, you know, it's interesting is, is we could take the pants off of one and put them on the other. What do you think? You can take a set off, yep. The cop seems to be winking, and uh, the soldier seems to be smirking. Maybe we want a smirking cop instead. So we'll swap their hats. There we go. What do you think? You know, if we were really ambitious, we could even take their arms off and move them over, too. Have you ever done that? We won't, we won't do that. You've done that? It is hard to put them on, so we'll leave them there. We'll put their hats back over here like this, and we'll pop them over here like this. There we go. Now they're back to their normal. That's pretty cool, huh? Well, you know what? I love Legos. Do you guys have Legos at home? You, you, uh, you, you obviously have Legos at home. She does, yeah. But you have some? Yep, we play with Legos. Legos are one of my favorite toys. At your Nana's too? That's right. Well, you got to have some everywhere just in case, you know. That's that's the fun part about Legos. Mm-hmm. That's right. Well, here's the thing about Legos is that you can build all kinds of stuff with Legos, can't you? You can build dragons, yep. You can build police cars. For our police guy here, right? Or you could build a tank for our little our little soldier, right? You could build the Elsa Castle, that's for sure. That's right. You can build almost anything with Legos. It's pretty neat. Have you ever been to the Lego store and how much they build? Yeah. You did. Well, see, here's the cool thing about Legos: is Legos tap into one of God's greatest gifts to us. Did you know that? Legos. Legos tap into our creativity. If you can imagine it, then you can probably build it with Legos, which is pretty neat. It's just like at school when you do art, or maybe if you draw, do any of you draw? Yeah, you draw, yeah, or paint, yeah, lots of different things, or like create things in the dirt. You ever go to the beach and do sand castles or something? Whenever you're building something, whenever you're making something, you are, you are being creative, and your creativity is one of your best gifts from God. Did you know that? And God, in fact, loves when we're creative because it's when we're most like he is. Did you know that he is the creator? That God created you and you and me and all of them. That's pretty cool, right? Yep, God created all of us. And do any of them look like each other? Even these two over here. These two are twins. And the de they don't quite look like each other, do they? Maybe more than most, but not entirely, right? Without your glasses, I know. I'll tell you what. You know? And we even change over time. Did you know that? I used to have hair on my head. It's a true story. I have pictures. So anyway, so the next time you play with Legos... So the next time you guys build or create anything, I want you to remember that God gave you the gift to be creative. 
and that's when we're most like God. Does that sound good? All right. Thank you for bringing your Lego, guys. I really appreciate that. Who would like to bring for me next week? You're not going to be here? You guys will be here. Right? Yeah, you guys will be here. That's unusual. Would you guys like to bring something? All right. Now, the question is, do I start a sibling rivalry and choose one of them? You might not be able to see from the back, but I'm getting a stare from my youngest right now. Jack did speak up. All right, so Jack, you can bring next week, okay? All right. And, and Paul, you can consult. How about that? All right, very good. Can we all have a hand and let's have a prayer? Let's have a prayer. Very good. Lord, thank you so much for making us so creative, for giving us that beautiful gift. Lord, help us to be like you as we create in this world that we would build up and that we would love people into, into better places in this world. Lord, we thank you for the love that you shared with us and the love you show us in these beautiful children. And we ask that you would bless us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. You guys can go back to your families. Black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Now at this time, we want to uh, invite uh, our youth up, and uh, we're going to drag Matt up here as well. And even our former youth, if anybody else wants to join us, if, if you've been uh, a part of the youth ministry here at the church, you're welcome to come on up. But uh, Matt will be leaving us after five years uh, as our youth director, and uh, we wanted just to take an opportunity because he has uh, poured out so much of his uh, life and his heart, and he's given up so much time with family and travel and all sorts of things uh, to be uh, present with our youth. And so we wanted to uh, take just a moment in the midst of our service and, and uh, um, honor uh, his work here among us, and we thought there'd be no better way than to turn it over to the youth and to let them share a uh, memory or a story or something that they'll uh, take from uh, Matt's time with them. So we'll just turn it over and you guys can share away. Well, are you sure? Are you sure? Oh, okay. Uh, so I have a card that he may or may not have seen before because I dropped it in the hallway. <laughs> uh, so this is a thank you card and it's probably upside down for all y'all. It has a bunch of signatures on the back, except for those who were not here today. Cheyenne, Katie. Uh, and a bunch of different memories from the years. Has a group selfie. And uh, three different pictures of Katie Hicks <laughs> with Matt alone. <laughs> Why did Lisa choose her? <laughs> All right. So thank you, Matt. That's my story. So I would not be where I am today without Matt Hunter. He has been an extremely important figure in my life for these past five years. Um, I don't think that I would have like survived high school practically without him. Um, he has helped me grow as a person and in my faith, and I am going to be forever grateful for the influence that he has had on my life, on my family, and on this church. Um, so, Matt has also had a big influence on me because I've only been in the youth group for two years, and this past year has been amazing with him, so just thank you for that. Oh, Matt. <laughs> Man, like, even from the beginning, you were so cool, and on our first mission trip, we were the only two guys, and... I just remember like late night talks of bonding and that you say you always be there for me and that's when I thought of you more as a friend than a youth minister. And I appreciate everything you've done. And even when I went off to college, you still reached out and talked to me. And I appreciate that a lot. <laughs> and, <laughs> and some of my best memories here with you, man. I'm just gonna miss you so much. <laughs> Thank you.
well, we are so grateful for Matt's five years with us. It is, um, it's been an incredible time, and we're grateful for all of, all of his work with us. And, uh, and it's always uh, hard to say goodbye, but uh, we want to celebrate Matt. So if you want to uh, find him in Fellowship Hall after the service, um, you'd be more than welcome to, to just share your thoughts and memories, the things that uh, come to mind uh, as you've uh, been reflecting on his ministry with us. So, oh, Thank you, Matt. It's time for our joys and concerns. So I already have a joy. Uh, the Boy Scout Troop 315 from when we meet up in the youth room up there has left at 6.30 this morning on our uh, summer camp for the year. They are heading up to Medicine Mountain in South Dakota. It's in the Black Hills by the uh, Mount Rushmore. That's the thing with the faces. Uh, it's a six-hour drive, so I'll pray for them to get there safely. We had uh, the most boys ever that in, I've ever known go on this mission trip. It is our entire troop of like 17 boys, minus two, me and another one who's up in the mountains doing some other camping activity, so it's basically all of us going. I'm Judith Huber, and I have a couple of joys. One, the first joy is to see Raven, because now that her school is out, she will be able to be with her, with us more Sundays, and that is a true blessing. I'm so glad. <laughs> and also, um, I have a joy that I probably through your prayers and hard work, the damage to my left vocal cord is lessening. And I am able to sing more, and I'm working hard on it. And at some point soon, I hope to commandeer my friend Bev and to work with me, and perhaps I can sing for you again. To his glory, always. This would be a good time for me to just jump in and uh, say that I want to just acknowledge that uh, Raven has officially completed all of her work for her master's degree. She'll uh, walk and officially graduate in December, but uh, we're very proud of all the work that she's done and, and uh, celebrate that uh, her weekends are now hers again. <laughs> <laughs> I have a joy. My name is Ron Oldham, and uh, last Tuesday would have been my mom and dad's uh, 66th wedding anniversary, but uh, they were looking down upon me and my son Shane. I'm a first-time grandpa. I have a granddaughter that was born on that day. So I just want to say thank you. Do we have any concerns? Carol Franks is my name. Yesterday, two former classmates um, that ended up marrying each other were in a horrific accident, and Jan was killed outright, and Bob is in critical condition, so please keep the Lee family in your prayers. Thank you. That's Judith Cooper again, and what has been lifted up I would add to, and, and that was, is not really a concern, but it is uh, asking. We on the praise team would very much appreciate y'all keeping us up to date because we receive prayers and uh, 
which is wonderful, and the prayers that you offer are so powerful. And we would like to, at all times when available, that you update us on those that you've asked us to pray for. And I'm going to give you an update on Christopher that we have been praying for, my grandnephew who is awaiting a kidney and liver transplant, which is probably not going to happen. He was admitted with internal bleeding. Uh, they have found it is not from the GI tract that he is bleeding. And yesterday, they did a bone marrow biopsy to see if he's just not making red blood cells. And so it's day to day. We don't know where this is going. But it's likely that it's not going to get better very quickly. We pray that he is at peace and he continues in his sweet nature and his love of the Lord, which is very strong. Mm. Thank you for your prayers in the past and now. <laughs> Are there any other concerns? I normally, I don't do this because I don't like getting up in front of everybody, but um, <laughs> oddly enough, so the director of the program that I just completed my master's with, she's also one of my professors, um, she's been going through a really hard time, and I offered to put her on her prayer list, and she emphatically said, yes, please. Her husband um, had some sort of heart surgery in the midst of her teaching, and then her son, Eric, and daughter-in-law, Rebecca, their marriage is uh, seriously struggling, um, and they've got a bunch of kids. So if you could just keep that whole family in your prayers, that'd be great. But, um, yeah, Roseanne, I'm not sure what her husband's name is, but it's Roseanne, Eric, Rebecca, um, and, of course, Roseanne's husband. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay, then, could we... Um go into a time of silent reflection. creating and sustaining God. We come before you in the powerful and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we come to you in the tension of hello and goodbye. We come to you in between joy and concern. We find ourselves living in the worlds of heavenly realms and earthly places. Lord, as we live in the middle, we ask that you would be present with us. But really, we know that you are always present with us, so we ask that you would Help us to recognize you. Help us to see the movement of your Holy Spirit. Help us to sense your way forward.
Lord, we ask as we say goodbye to Matt that you would bless him in his going. That you would fill his future with your promise. We pray a blessing upon his house and strength in this new chapter. We pray for the youth that have been touched by his ministry here. And we lift them up to your care that they would continue to grow in their faith, to hunger and seek after you. And Lord, as we welcome new folks to our midst, new staff, new members, new hearts, we pray that new beginnings would grow into strong and fruitful ministries. We pray that the foundation that you have built in this place would be only the start. Lord, help us to hunger for you. Set us on fire for your gospel. Give us courage to share it with all we know, that those who know us would come to know you. Lord, we lift up these joys and concerns, the wonder and beauty of new life among us. We give them over to you in the powerful and precious name of Jesus Christ, the one who taught us how to live the one who shows us how to love, and the one who brings us together in prayer as we now say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our response hymn is, I want to walk as a child of the light. It's hymn number 206. Would you join your voices together in song and praise?
start of the night and the day are both alike. The love is the light of the city of God. Shine in my heart, Lord Jesus. Good morning. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. Salt and light. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket, but on the, on the lamp stand and gives it light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that we may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, grace be yours and peace from Jesus Christ, our Lord. I promised you last week that we would be starting a, a new series this week, and normally my custom has been when I start a new series to put together a pamphlet that has uh, some space for you to write some notes if you're a note taker and, and has the scripture passage that we'll be considering for that particular week, uh, the weeks throughout the, the series, so you can kind of look ahead and see where we're going. Uh, but wanted to do something a little different with this series, so what we're going to do is we're going to produce uh, a new insert for you each week, and if you happen to miss a week, we'll, we'll give you some highlights that you can add, and over the course of the next uh, several weeks, you'll put together sort of a, a group of your notes and some uh, questions to be reflecting on and some challenges and prayer that uh, I want to give to you throughout this, uh, throughout this series. The series is called Let Your Light Shine, which is actually the command of the verse that James just read for us this morning. In the same way, let your light shine before others. The, uh, the message last week, as we tried to pack the pews, and so many of you were here and so many others made special effort to be here, the message I brought to you then was that God had something for us. That God not only had something, but something really important for us, and that was for the last seven years, God has been healing this family and building our foundation on the bedrock of Jesus Christ, digging down deep that we might be on solid ground. But now we are done setting the foundation. God has laid the cornerstone in our hearts, and now, now, friends, it is time to build up the household of God. We are going to experience what I call manifold increase. Increase in numbers for sure, but more importantly, increase in the depth of our attentiveness to God's Holy Spirit increase in the reach of our ministries into the community, increase in the power of our presence in the city. Now it is time to build up the household of God, to realize what God promises, but it's going to take all of us. It's going to take each and every one of us to make that happen, and that is that is what our series is about. That is what Let Your Light Shine means. As we look forward to these next several weeks, it's going to be about equipping you to do that work. It's going to be about empowering you as a person of faith, as a follower of Jesus Christ, to participate in the building up of the household of God. 
If we are going to truly experience that manifold increase, then it's never going to be enough to simply attract people who are already in a relationship with Jesus Christ. You realize that happens, right? That happens all the time in churches. We call it, sometimes we call it the, the, the shuffling of the faithful. Right? So and so church over here has a new minister and suddenly there's an influx in another church nearby, right? We've all experienced that. We've experienced the opposite where someone comes and others go. It's that kind of that moving around of folks who already know Jesus and are just looking for a place to kind of settle. Many of you, that's your story. Many of you, that's how you came into these walls, and that's, that's awesome. That's how we build up the family. That's one way. That's one way. But we are never going to get to this manifold increase if the only thing we do is attract people who already know Jesus. We need to go make disciples. And not just because our discipline tells us, but because Jesus commands it. Jesus commands it at the end of Matthew's gospel, go into all the world making disciples of nations and baptizing in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's not a suggestion. That's not a, in case you have time, you know, between Bible studies. That's not a, when you're not busy doing your day job. That's a go. That's a command. We are to make disciples. If we are going to realize this manifold increase, it's going to be because we're out making disciples. And so we talked Briefly, and I'm going to elaborate today, I'm going to elaborate today on the idea that sheep make sheep. Now, if you, if you don't have one of our handouts for today and you'd like one, you can just raise your hand there. We'll run around and get them to you. I want to make sure that you have that, that space. There we go. We'll get around to you. But as they're coming, I'll just update you here on this. I was in Thermopolis. Uh, worshiping with my family and my, my dad at the church that he serves in music ministry, uh, Thermopolis. It's a federated church, so Presbyterians and Methodists actually coexist in one place there. It's pretty remarkable. And uh, they, they, have, uh, uh, they had this uh, special celebration for a woman who had been in this church and a servant of Christ for decades. And uh, a relative of hers is a pastor in another tradition in, in uh, West Virginia. And she was there and was going to give a witness. Now, as I mentioned last week, if you, if you afford a pastor the opportunity to give a witness, what you're going to get is a sermon, right? But, uh, but it was a great sermon. It was a fantastic witness. And, and as part of that witness, she was sharing about how they were reaching out into the community that she was serving. And uh, she had this great turn of phrase that I'd never heard before, but loved and immediately reached for a pen and jotted it down on my bulletin and then crumpled it up and put it in my pocket so I could share it with you all. And that's Sheep make sheep. Pastors are shepherds. Shepherds tend to the flock. But sheep make sheep. Shepherds don't make sheep. Now, some of you snicker at that. We've got some, some ranchers and some farmers here who recognize the significance of this phrase, right? Sheep make sheep. The shepherd isn't making any sheep. The shepherd just tends to the sheep, guides and protects but the sheep make sheep. That's important for us to, to think about that for just a moment. Because so often in our culture, so often in the culture of the body of Christ, we think the pastor's supposed to make sheep. Isn't that why you pay me? Isn't that why you've hired me to do this work? So that I'll make the sheep, and you can just be the sheep. But you see that phrase, shepherds don't make sheep. Shepherds don't make sheep, they tend the sheep. They help the sheep grow. They help the sheep make sheep, but it's really the sheep who make sheep. And so I, I started, I know this is kind of dangerous when a pastor pulls out his calculator. I know you finance people are sweating right now, but it's okay. It's a simple math here, I think I can handle it. I did a little bit of math here, okay? So if, if I were to bring 10 people to Christ in a year, I'd be doing pretty good. We'd be doing pretty good. It takes energy. You have to commit to relationship with people in order to truly bring them to Christ. I'm talking about brand new believers who've never followed Jesus or have fallen away, and they're coming back into relationship with Christ. If I were to make 10 
disciples. Brand spanking new disciples, and all ten of them joined the church, then this church would grow by 3% that year. Give or take a tenth of a percent. 3%. Now, if each one of you, we average about 150 in worship, if each one of you were to spend that same year and make one disciple of Jesus Christ, just one. If you were to witness your faith and lead someone to Christ, just one person in the next year, and only half of them join the church, we would increase by about 25%. Do you realize that? You see why it's not a good idea to lead the shepherd to make the sheep? There's a whole lot more of you with a whole lot more time than I have. Sheep make sheep. It's important that we engage in this together. It's not enough for us to be armchair disciples, coaching the pastor from the sideline. It's not enough for us to be Monday morning quarterbacks and say, you know, gee, I wouldn't have used that illustration, or, man, if he had just prayed a little less, or maybe we'd gotten out in time for brunch. It's important for us to recognize that we all have a, a role to play. That it's not my job to make disciples, but our job to make disciples. As I was reflecting on this idea, sheep make sheep, I, I could have gone to lots of metaphors. Jesus talks about being the good shepherd. Shepherd metaphors run throughout Scripture, Old and New Testament. I could have gone into lots of opportunities to talk about sheep. Jesus talks about sheep. Other parts of Scripture talk about sheep. But I went to this passage in Matthew 5. I was brought to it in part for lots of different reasons. One, one it was one of our VBS memorization Bible scriptures. It, it, if you were, came to VBS, you might remember the second half of this scripture. Okay? You remember it? It was, it was Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. That was one of our verses. Day two, I think. And the surprise on the kid's face when I told them, you know that song, you know, This Little Light of Mine? And I'd have them get their lights out. And I'd say, you realize that that song is based on this verse, right? And they would give me blank stares, kind of like you are right now. <laughs> yeah. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let your light shine before others that they might see your good deeds and give glory to your Father in heaven. So it was one of our VBS verses. So it was in the back of my mind as I was thinking about where I was going with this series, where I wanted to begin this sheep make sheep business. And then, and then I settled on it finally. And I submitted it to Lisa to put the bulletin together. And she texted me as I was preparing to leave for a camping trip. And she said, hey, do you realize that you're preaching on the same Bible verse that Lori preached on two weeks ago? Except hers was about salt. We're going to talk about light today. And if you haven't heard Lori's message, you should. It's really good. It's, it's still on the website. You can find that. And if you can't find it, email me and I'll make sure you can. But she was preaching about salt, how we're all valuable in the Lord's eyes, that we're all lending flavor to this world to bring the, fav the flavor of discipleship. Well, today we're going to talk about the light of discipleship, letting your light shine. Jesus is also, you see, preaching not to a, a few people as he gathers for what is the second part of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount goes on for three chapters. You should really read it. It's quite powerful. He kind of goes all over the place, lots of different subjects. But right after the Beatitudes, the blessed are the weak, those who mourn, blessed are the peacekeepers, or the peacemakers, the peacemakers. After the Beatitudes, then you have this passage. You are salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are salt and light. But Jesus isn't just preaching to those little band of disciples. If you read at the end of chapter, or at the beginning of chapter 5, Jesus saw the crowds that were gathering. They were coming because he was performing miracles and he was teaching in the towns around the area. And they were coming from all over to hear him preach. And as the crowds gathered, he went up on the mountainside 
and he began to preach. So he's preaching to a crowd. He's not preaching to the select few. This isn't a message for the pastors among us. This isn't a message for the elite among us. This isn't a group only for the administrative council among us. This is a sermon for all of us. And there's a couple things I want to draw about. Lori did such a great job with the salt metaphor. I'm going to leave that to her and invite you to go find that message because it was really good. So we're going to jump to verse 14. Verse 14 is unambiguous. It says, you are the light of the world. Now, incidentally, I want to invite you, if you haven't already, grab, grab your Bible and open it up to Matthew 5. Find that in your own Bible, and I want you just to, if you... If you're so inclined, just to quick like underline that for just a moment. Just highlight that in your Bible, because every time you come across verse 5, uh, 14, I want you to remember this, that you are the light of the world. That's what Jesus says. You are the light of the world. That is not ambiguous. Jesus doesn't say, sometimes you resemble the light of the world. Jesus doesn't say, when you choose to be, you are the light of the world. Jesus doesn't say, you know, if you follow these rules and ensconce them in a book and beat people over the head with them, you are the light of the world. Jesus just says, you are the light of the world. That means you are the light. You don't have a choice. You follow Jesus. You become the light. The light gets in you and you are illumined. That's how that works. It's not ambiguous. You are the light of the world. There's no getting around it. There's no hiding it. And in case you forgot, in case you forget, you just keep reading that verse and it says, a city built on a hill cannot be hid. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. You see, here's the deal. You are the light whether you want to be or not. You might be the only Christian someone at your work knows. You might be the only follower of Jesus that the folks at the senior center encounter. You might be the only person of faith in Jesus Christ that those students see. And you are the light of the world. You don't have a choice about it. Because they are going to see you. And because they see you, they will make judgments about the God you serve. Let your light shine, Jesus says. I recently did a memorial service. It was really my privilege to do this service. It was for uh, a friend of ours here in this community of faith, Burl uh, DeBoard. Burl was 95, and uh, the father of uh, a gentleman who had pastored in this community for nearly three decades at the Nazarene Church. Now, I knew Burl was the son of David DeBoard, and David and I had been running in similar circles, but had never crossed paths until his father passed away. And I had known that Burl had been a Nazarene pastor in his life. That was all I really knew about his career, what he did for a living. I knew that he was a Nazarene pastor, and that he lived at Inglenook, and he liked riding the bus over here. And I heard some great stories about how he ended up here. Uh, his ride fell through to the Nazarene church that he was attending in Denver, and uh, there were a bunch of Methodists gathered to catch the bus to come here, and so they invited him to join them, and he liked it, so he stayed, which was kind of fun. I love that when that happens. Burl was a character, though. He'd always come out, and he, he always tried to give me a, a little you know, snippet from the sermon or comment about something that I said. You know, the good preacher wants to make sure that the one in front doesn't think that he's asleep, right? So we got to engage in this. You know, I'd have done it differently. We, we, we had this great little banter back and forth, but it was really as, as I sat down with his son and his daughter and his son-in-law to talk about the service that, that David, his son, said something to me that just stuck with me. And in fact, this, this for me is so vivid about the point I'm trying to make here that I actually went back into my computer after finishing the sermon and inserted this illustration because I wanted you to hear the story about Burl. His son said that in the 70s, after having pastored as a Nazarene pastor for 25 years, 
Burl and his family settled here in the Denver area, and when they came here, he went back to his first career, which was as an upholsterer. And he spent the rest of his career, the rest of his working life, as an upholsterer. In fact, even, even into his time at Inglenook, he would continue to do small jobs for people, upholstering. And his son said this, he said, you know, Dad made his living as an upholsterer, but he always saw himself as a minister. He made his living as an upholsterer, but he always saw himself as a minister. Man, that is such a powerful illustration of what it means for us to be in ministry. We are a city built on a hill. We don't get to hide that we have the light. We are the light. And Jesus says, you are the light, so let your light shine that others might see your good deeds and give glory to your Father in heaven. But that can be a double-edged sword, can it? That can be a double-edged sword. My father always used the illustration of when he moved to Pueblo, they had a, they had a couple of hospitals there in Pueblo, and, and a, as the pastor, you had a, a parking spot that you could occupy. It was the pastor's parking spot, but in order to park there, you had to have a bumper sticker on your car that said, Pastor. It was like your pastor permit. The problem with putting the word pastor on the bumper of your car is it changes the way you drive. <laughs> I'm serious, right? It's like putting that little fish emblem on the back of your car, right? Let your light shine. It changes the way you drive. And you have to pause and think, do I want that word pastor on the back of my car so that every time I cut someone off or do something foolish, Somebody knows they were just cut off by a pastor. That, that, that's not going to be a good light to shine, right? It can be a double-edged sword. You see, a city built on a hill cannot be hidden. You and I are cities built on a hill. We are the light of the world. We cannot be hidden. So we better make our presence count. We better make our presence mean something. Your light is lit. The question is, what are you going to do with it? Are we going to follow Christ's command? Let your light shine, that others may see your good deeds and give glory to your Father in heaven. Your light is lit as a believer, as a disciple of Jesus Christ. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to let your light shine before others? You know, there's a funny thing about titles. I've been really, been really working on these, these titles for people in the church. You know, as we gather as the family, the people of God, I'm, I actually had somebody come to me, and, and I was introducing myself as pastor. But someone else said, well, we, we typically call you reverend. So what's the difference between pastor and reverend? What's the difference between minister, pastor? What, what does that mean? Is there a difference? Are you making some sort of distinction? And we sort of use those terms as interchangeable, but I want to sort of fetter them out a little bit. I want to make some distinctions here. So funny thing about titles is that pastor literally means in the Latin shepherd. It's the Latin word for shepherd. So a pastor is a shepherd, right? Shepherds don't make sheep. Sheep make sheep. You see the illustration? Okay. Pastor, shepherd. But the weird thing is, is that we also, we also use the term minister to refer to the things that I do. Minister. It's funny when you start looking up these words. Minister is from the Middle English. Pastor is from the Latin. Minister is from Middle English. And it means someone who acts upon the authority of another. It's why we call cabinet officials here in our country ministers, right? You have the Ministry of the Interior. The interior if I could spit it out. You have, you have the Foreign Ministry, right? You have other, other things like... So ministry is... A, a minister is, is somebody who acts under the authority of an ultimate authority, which is why they call you me minister. I operate under the authority of a higher being, Christ, alive in me, right? One who acts upon the authority of another. It's also a servant, sometimes an administrator. But here's the thing about ministers. 
It's easy for us to use minister and pastor interchangeably, but there's a distinction that we need to draw here. Because in the metaphor of shepherds, shepherd, sheep make sheep, the ministers in that equation aren't the shepherds. The ministers are the sheep. The ministers are the sheep. You are acting upon the authority of Christ. As sheep, you are ministers. When in the Methodist church somebody expresses an interest in perhaps dabbling in the craziness that is the ordained ministry, someone comes to their pastor and says, I'm thinking I might want to be a minister. We immediately have them psychologically checked out, right? Because we want to make sure. You got to be a little crazy to be a minister, I promise you. But the first thing we're supposed to, that was a joke, by the way. The first thing we're supposed to do, just in case you were wondering, the first thing we're supposed to do is we hand them this book, and the title of this little book, this little pamphlet, I, I was handed it by the pastor that I went to, and I've handed it to several people, you know, in my 12 years of ministry. It's called The Christian as Minister. Now, one of the weird things about this book is I was expressing a call to ordain ministry. I was going to my pastor going, I want to do what you do. I feel called to do what you do as a minister, as a pastor, as a ordained elder in the church. Now, having grown up in a pastor's home, I knew a little bit more about what that meant than some people would. But I went with a specific goal in mind, and he handed me this book called The Christian as Minister, and I began to read it and realized that there were several chapters, only one of which seemed to apply to where I was going or where I thought I was going. And the reason for that is because it begins with the ministry of all of us. It starts with the premise that we are all ministers. All of us. Every single one of us. Whether you're a hundred or five or anything in between. Whether you're brand new in the faith or you've been a Methodist longer than I've been alive. We are all ministers. And then the book goes on to draw some distinctions between other kinds of ministry that are set aside and ordained, etc. But we are all ministers, is the point. That means the sheep are the ministers. You are the ministers, not just me. I have a responsibility to make disciples of Jesus Christ, but not because I'm a pastor, but because I am a follower of Jesus Christ. You have a responsibility to make sheep because you are a follower of the Good Shepherd. Because sheep make sheep. We all are acting upon the authority of Jesus Christ, the Good Shepherd in our lives. Now, my job as pastor, that's what I do for a living. You guys do different things for a living. Some of you work for airlines. Some of you work for space companies. Some of you have been lawyers or teachers or doctors or nurses or fill-in-the-blank, stay-at-home moms, hardest job ever, I think. I couldn't do that job, I promise you. Stay-at-home dads. Whatever it is you do, what I do is pastor. Now, what that means, usually, if you want to come in the day of life of a pastor, is, as my son said when he was two, I'm, I'm a minister, I'm going to a meeting. That's what ministers do. We go to meetings. We sit through meetings and we talk about things until we're done talking, right? We get up here and you think, man, he's never done talking. I'm not sure if he's ever been quiet, right? But what I do is teach and equip and grow and challenge and push and prod, comfort, nurture, pray with, pray for, only about half of which is exclusive to my job. But you see, this is what I do for a living, but I, I, I do this as a calling. But the things I'm challenging you to do are the same things that I'm responsible for as a disciple of Jesus Christ. My job as pastor, my role is living as a minister. Being a sheep. Out making other sheep. Now you might be thinking, that's all well and good for you, pastor, but your whole life is about ministry. Let me tell you, there are some mundane, unfaith-like things you have to do 
like budgets. Budgets can be a faithful thing, for sure. But administration, dealing with what are we going to do about the audiovisual here in the church? Are we going to get TVs? Are we going? These aren't things they train you for in seminary, right? When you come in and the water bill is four times what it should be, and it's only been two weeks instead of four, and we have to figure out where the leak is. Or when you come in on a Sunday morning and there's uh, debris left from the Vacation Bible School, uh, duct taped to the wall, too high for me to get, thanks to Harry, we got the ladder and got it down. We almost hiked Mike up there, but these are the things that we just do. These are the, the nitty-gritty things that just have to get done. We have to pay the bills. We've got to run the stewardship cam campaign. We've got to have the meetings. We've got to organize the church. We've got to do those things. We've got to meet and do Bible studies and all that, but, but the truth is, just like Burl, just like Burl who made his living as an upholsterer but always saw himself as a minister, you could fill in that blank. I'm a retired. I'm a teacher. I'm a scientist or a mother or a rancher or a farmer or fill in the blank. But I'm a minister. And my job is to make sheep. My job is to be in ministry. One last title I want to share with you. We talked about pastor. We talked about minister. This one is right from the scriptures. It's, it's apostle. Apostle is kind of an odd term. We talk about it. We talk about the apostle Paul. We talk about the disciples becoming apostles. And usually when we talk about apostle and disciple, we use them kind of as, as two halves of the same coin, right? So you have the disciple who follows and you have the apostle who is sent. That's usually how we, how we describe them. The apostle is sent from being a disciple. You are a disciple and you get sent from a follower into one who is sent. But the funny thing about apostle is it's not really a religious word. It, it has no connection to the Jewish roots of Jesus. It's a word that was actually a Greek word that a principle adopted by the Roman Empire as they set about conquering the world. The Roman Empire would go around conquering the world, and what they realized is that once they conquered a place and then they move on to the next place, the first place didn't really behave very well. For some reason, they didn't like being ruled. Imagine that. And so what they started doing is they took this idea from the Greek of the apostle, and they would send an, ad an administrative soul, someone who would go in, and their main job, I love this language, so I want to share it with you. Uh, an apostle would work to reshape the culture and bring people into alignment with the values and the practices of the conquering kingdom. That was their job. It wasn't just that they were sent with some message. It's that they were sent to create in the place that they go the same culture that they were sent from. You follow me? That's the more robust idea of apostle. The apostle wasn't just one sent, it was someone sent to enculturate wherever they went with the culture of where they came from. So an apostle of Jesus Christ is to take the culture established in the family of God, in the kingdom of God that we have here, to go elsewhere and to create that culture wherever you are. That's an apostle. That's the term that Jesus uses when he sends them out he sends them out as apostles to bring the culture of God's kingdom wherever we are. We are sheep called to bring the kingdom of God wherever we are as ministers. And you say, I'm a plumber, so bring the kingdom of God into your plumbing. You meet people, don't you? I'm a teacher, and we're not supposed to talk about things. Well, doesn't mean you can't live the kingdom wherever you are. It doesn't mean you can't establish a kingdom culture wherever you are. You say, well, I'm retired. All I do is go to the senior center. Well, I'm sure there are seniors there who need Jesus too. You say, I work with teenagers. They don't listen to anything I say. 
You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. We are called to be ministers, sheep making sheep in the world, no matter what we're doing. Paul was an example of this. We talk about him being the tent maker. He would go in and he would set up shop and he would make tents. And while he was making tents, he would tell people about Jesus. Well, maybe while you deliver that food or you teach that class or you play bridge or you do whatever it is you do, you share the light. You let your light shine that others might see your good deeds and give glory to your Father in heaven. And we just might make some sheep when we do it together. Amen. We come to that time of service when uh, we have been so blessed with the blessings that Jesus has given us that we now give some back to him. Would the ushers please come forward? this offering to manifold your presence in this city by glorifying your name, love, and grace, that we can go forward and make disciples in your name. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we transition from worship in this place to the worship of living our lives together as ministers of faith, uh, I want to invite you, if you have need of extra prayer, to uh, take advantage of prayer ministry up here at the front of the sanctuary following the service, or find your way into the prayer chapel and uh, take part in our communion uh, offered there as well. And don't forget to join us in the fellowship time uh, following the service as we uh, continue celebrating that ministry with us. Now let us join together in our benediction song. And now may you go out, a city on the hill, to let your light shine before others. Go, that all might come to know your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Go in peace. You are loved. <laughs>